Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Chuck Matthews. I'm here with Jerry Katz. And we're here today to talk about the volume four of the Annals of Entrepreneurship Education and Pedagogy coming out in January of 2021. Uh, I am the editor of uh, volumes three and four and five. Three came out in 2018, four will be out in January of 2021, and we'll look for volume five, uh, hopefully down the road a couple of years after volume four. Uh, but it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Jerry Katz uh, to uh, speak with today. Uh, Jerry is um, uh, an excellent uh, writer, obviously. He is a contributor and author of the volume three, an excellent chapter on business plans. And in volume four, uh, coming out in January, he is one of our five master educators, the opportunity to read from five of our colleagues that have some incredible insights to share with us. Uh, so we'll be talking a little bit about that. Uh, Jerry is the Brockhaus Endowed Chair at St. Louis University and has been for some time. He is the author of one of the leading textbooks with McGraw-Hill in uh, small business and entrepreneurship. He is the founding editor of the Emerald Group Publishers uh, and a past director of the Billiken Angel Network in St. Louis, amongst many other uh, great accomplishments. Uh, he is uh, also uh, uh, a Long and Necker Fellow of the uh, USOSBE, the U.S. Association for Small Business and Entrepreneurship. Uh, and uh, he and I share a common mentor in, in Bob Brockhouse for, the endow for whom the endowed chair that he holds is named. So it's great, Jerry, it's great to, to catch up with you. Welcome uh, to the episode today. Glad to be here. Glad to uh, get seen by all of you. <laughs> Very good. It's always good to be seen. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's get right to it. Uh, on volume uh, four, uh, my excellent co-editor, Eric Ligori, and I have been very pleased with all of the authors and contributions that have come in. But both of us are very, very excited about this year's five master educators, of which uh, you are definitely one. Uh, so in your uh, uh, excellent uh, write-up, you noted that for us as entrepreneurship educators, it is a remarkable privilege and a tremendous importance. I love that phrase. But then immediately you, you took us uh, outside the classroom into the, into the world and said, you know, it's a larger world outside the classroom. Tell us a little bit about what you're thinking there in terms of uh, our, both our classroom, but obviously outside the classroom in terms of entrepreneurship education. You know, it, with the, the COVID pandemic, one of the things is that a lot of the work I've been doing uh, has moved out of the classroom. Uh, it looks just like what we're doing here because a lot of the time I'm on the phone or I'm on Zoom uh, with folks, and sometimes there are uh, uh, other there are other classrooms, but in a lot of places, it's been situations where uh, I'm presenting to a local trade or professional association, the restaurant association. Uh, in St. Louis, there's a group called Volunteer Lawyers and Accountants for the Arts, uh, and all of these different folks are asking for advice on how to uh, negotiate through the pandemic if you are a small business owner. The fact is that none of us uh, uh, actually have a cheat sheet that says, here are the five things you absolutely must do and all of the experts have agreed. We're making this up as we go along, which is exactly what those entrepreneurs are doing. And a lot of the time, part of what uh, I end up doing is playing a little bit of a Johnny Appleseed. I saw a local uh, business that did something I said, that was brilliant. And part of what I do is you know, say, hey, have you heard about Soul Taco doing this and uh, uh, these other groups doing that? So in a funny sort of way, part of what we can do as educators is we can celebrate those examples of entrepreneurs, small business owners that have done something great and exceptional. And by telling their story, uh, uh, recounting their story to others, we spread the word and help out. And that's always appreciated. That, that, that's so true. And, and indeed, you captured that nicely in terms of, you know, we have to change with conditions. Uh, I think Henry Mintzberg talked about deliberate and emergent uh, strategies. And indeed, the world of entrepreneurship and small business, uh, micro, small, medium uh, enterprise owners have to really step up and, and uh, mm -hmm. go with that organic uh, growth. So our role in that is, is very important. 
Um, so building on that, uh, you talk also in your chapter a little bit about giving non-academic talks. And, and I think you mentioned in there, you know, don't just think of entrepreneurship as only for entrepreneurs. An interesting uh, phrase, I, I, I must say. So tell us a little bit about that. Non-academic talks and, and, and what's a little bit of your thinking about entrepreneurship for uh, non-entrepreneurs? Well, you know, one of the examples I, I, I talk about is I've found myself, uh, some of the most interesting situations I found myself in as an entrepreneurship professor have been in situations where I, I was talking about entrepreneurship, but very often to people who are not at that moment entrepreneurs. Uh, a couple months before the Oslo Accords were signed, which uh, end the first in Tafada in uh, the West Bank, in Gaza, I was literally in a trailer in the no man's land between the Israeli settlements and the, Air, uh, the Palestinian settlements. And every morning we'd go out there and we were in, an R, in this trailer and the Palestinians would come over and we would sit and they were trying to figure out, okay, when the West Bank opens up to Israel and they could have trade across the borders, uh, how do they make make uh, use of that? What are the differences in how Israeli businesses and Palestinian businesses uh, uh, operate? And so I was there answering questions, figuring out where what kind of data to get for the next meeting and giving them advice. Fast forward a couple decades. I live in St. Louis and uh, Ferguson. Missouri is actually a St. Louis suburb, and you all know Ferguson. You, you remember Michael Brown and the, uh, his death and the riots because that was a prelude for what we've been going through now. But those after the death of Michael Brown, uh, when there were the protests uh, at night that often turned into riots, that a couple hundred feet down the road from uh, uh, the housing development where he was killed, uh, Michael Brown was killed, there was a church and a group of us, uh, uh, a lot of professors and local entrepreneurs were there every day talking to local community members about how to use entrepreneurship to rebuild the community and to build ties between Ferguson and the rest of St. Louis to get more of St. Louis uh, there and get their money there, get their uh, 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 support there. Uh, so there is this, uh, there is, uh, Sarah Sarvati has this wonderful expression, world making. And uh, that's part of what our entrepreneurship is. We help people make their world and remake their world. And a lot of the time that means we should find ourselves in places that are not entrepreneurial at this moment, but they're asking us for guidance on how to become entrepreneurial for that future world. You know, and to me, that's that's always been one of the greatest uh, opportunities. Oh, definitely, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, again, you've captured it very nicely, and there's so much more in your chapter to uh, illuminate what you just described: uh, entrepreneurship on a, a global setting, not just in the classroom, but uh, in the outside world and context. And uh, again, that emergent theme comes out: um, making and remaking uh, the world. And entrepreneurship is certainly that. Entrepreneurship, without question, is the economic engine. Yeah. Uh, of any country and, and innovation and, and creativity are its fuel. So uh, again, we're, we're charged uh, across uh, multiple dimensions. Mm -hmm.